I don't work at a 7-Eleven. This at one point was the dumbest thing I had ever bought on eBay. And then about 10 years later, I found it, put it on, and I'm owning it. I own it, but now I'm owning it. So I don't work at 7-Eleven, but I work at 7-Eleven. Anywho, today I thought uh, we'd read a story, another story actually, from Suddenly a Knock on the Door by Edgar Carrot, the Israeli author. Uh, this is the eponymous story, and while I'm going to have to censor a little bit of it, I'm going to give a little disclaimer as well. It's dark. Shocking, right? I mean, every I tend to lean towards the darker stories. I mean, I didn't love to read as a kid, and, you know, I can imagine a lot of people didn't learn to love to read by reading Old Yeller. So, and that's a dark story too, that's a bad example, but regardless. This is a dark story, these are the stories I always liked, that's what got me into reading, so. Without any further ado, the story is entitled, What of this goldfish would you wish? I like it, okay. <laughs> I'm a fan, just saying. Jonathan had a brilliant idea for a documentary. He'd knock on doors, just him. No camera crew, no nonsense. Just Jonathan, on his own. Small camera in hand, asking, If you found a talking goldfish that granted you three wishes, what would you wish for? Folks would give their answers, and Johnny would edit them down and make clips of the more surprising responses. Before every set of answers, you'd see the person standing stock still in the entrance to his house. Onto this shot, he'd superimpose the subject's name, family situation, monthly income, maybe even the party he'd voted for in the last election, all that combined with the three wishes, and maybe he'd end up with a poignant piece of social commentary, a testament to the massive rift between our dreams and the often compromised reality in which we live. It was genius, Johnny was sure. And if not, at least it was cheap. All he needed was a door to knock on and a heart beating on the other side. With a little decent footage, he was sure he'd be able to sell it to Channel 8 or Discovery in a flash. Either as a film or as a bunch of vignettes, little cinematic corners, each with that singular soul standing in a doorway, followed by three killer wishes, precious, every one. Even better, maybe he'd cash out, package it with a slogan, and sell it to a bank or sell you a phone company. Maybe tag it with something like, Different dreams, different wishes. One bank. Or the bank that makes dreams come true. No prep, no plotting, natural as can be. Johnny grabbed his camera and went out knocking on doors. In the first neighborhood he went to, the kindly folk that took part generally requested the foreseeable things. Health, money, bigger apartments, either to shave off a couple of years or a couple of pounds. But there were also powerful moments when drawn, wizened old lady asked simply for a child. A Holocaust survivor with a number on his arm asked very slowly, in a quiet voice, as if he'd been waiting for Johnny to come, as if it weren't an exercise at all. He'd been wondering, if this fish didn't mind, would it be possible for all the Nazis left living in the world to be held accountable for their crimes? A cocky, broad-shouldered lady killer put out his cigarette, Lady killer does not literally mean murdering ladies, like somebody who, you know, dates a lot of ladies. Uh, put out a cigarette and, as if the camera wasn't there, wished he were a girl. Just for a night, he added, holding a single finger right up to the lens. And these were wishes, I guess it was more like this. And these were the wishes from just one short block in one small, sleepy suburb of Tel Aviv, Israel. Jonathan could hardly imagine what people were dreaming of in the development towns and the collectives along the northern border and the West Bank settlements and Arab villages. The immigrant absorb... <laughs> one take. The immigrant absorption centers full of broken trailers and tired people left to broil out in the desert sun. Jonathan knew that if the project was going to have any weight, he'd have to get everyone, to the unemployed, to the ultra-religious, to the Arabs, and Ethiopians, and American expats. 
He began to plan a shooting schedule for the coming days. Jaffa, Demona, Ashdod, maybe even Hebron, even. If he could sneak past the wall, Hebron would be great. Maybe somewhere in that city, some beleaguered Arab man would stand in his doorway and, looking through Jonathan and his lens, looking out into nothingness, would just pause for a minute, nod his head, and wish for peace. That would be something to see. Sergei Gorolik doesn't much like strangers begging on his door. So now we have a new character named Sergei. Especially when those strangers are asking him questions. In Russia, when Sergei was young, it happened plenty. The KGB felt right at home knocking on his door. His father had been a Zionist, which was pretty much an invitation for them to drop by at any old time. When Sergei got to Israel, and then moved to Java. His family couldn't wrap their heads around it. They'd ask him, What are you looking to find in a place like that? There's no one but addicts and Arabs and pensioners. I'm Eastern European. I don't do a good Eastern European accent or Russian accent, but you know what? I'm allowed to. But what is most excellent about addicts and Arabs and pensioners is that they don't come around knocking on Sergei's door. That way, Sergei can get to sleep and get up when it's still dark. He could take his little boat out into sea and fish until he's done fishing, by himself, in silence, the way it should be, the way it was. Until one day, some kid with a ring in his ear comes knocking. Hard like that, rapping at his door, just the way Sergei doesn't like. And he says, this kid, that he has some questions he wants to put on the television. Sergei tells the boy, tells him, in what he thinks is a straightforward manner, that if he doesn't want it, that, that he doesn't want it, not interested. Sergei gives the camera a shove to help make it clear, but the, the earring boy is stubborn. He says all kinds of things, fast things, and it's hard for Sergei to follow. His Hebrew isn't so good, the language they speak in Israel. The boy slows down, tells Sergei he has a strong face, a nice face, and that he simply has to have him for this movie picture. Sergei can also slow down. He can also make clear. He tells the kid to get out. The kid is slippery. And somehow, between saying no and pushing the door closed, Sergei finds that the kid is in his house. He's already making his movie, running his camera without any permission. And from behind the camera, he's still telling Sergei about his face, that it's full of feeling, that it's tender. Suddenly, the kid spots Sergei's goldfish flitting around in its big glass jar in the kitchen. The kid with the earring starts screaming, Goldfish! Goldfish! He's so excited! And this, this really pressures Sergei, who tells the kid, He's nothing, just a regular goldfish. Stop filming it. It's just, just the goldfish, Sergei tells him. Just something he found flapping around in the net. A deep sea goldfish. But the boy isn't listening. He's still filming. Remember, the kid is asking a question. If you had a magical goldfish, grants you three wishes. This guy happens to have a goldfish. This kid gets really excited. But the boy isn't listening. He's still filming it and getting closer and saying something about talking and fish and a magic wish. Sergei doesn't like this. He doesn't like that the boy is almost at it. Almost reaching for the jar. In this instance, Sergei understands the boy didn't come for television. What he came for specifically is to snatch Sergei's fish, to steal it away. Before the mind of Sergei Gorlik really understands what it is his body has done, he seems to have taken the burner off the stove and poosh, hit the boy in the head. The boy falls. The camera falls with him. The camera breaks open on the floor, along with the boy's skull. It's a lot of blood coming out of the head, and Sergei really doesn't know what to do. That is, he knows exactly what to do, but it really would complicate things. Because if he takes this kid to the hospital, people are going to ask what happened, and it would take things in a direction Sergei does not want to go. No reason to take him to the hospital anyway, says the goldfish in Russian. That one's already dead, said the goldfish. He can't be dead, Sergei says with a moan. 
<sighs> I barely touched him. It's only a burner. Only a little thing. Sergei holds it up to the fish, taps it against his own skull to prove it. He's not even that hard. Maybe not, says the fish. But apparently it's harder than a kid's head. He wanted to take it from me, Sergei says, almost crying. Nonsense, the fish says. He was only here to make a little something for television. But, but he said... He said, says the fish, interrupting, exactly what he was doing. You didn't get it. Honestly, you're Hebrew. It's terrible. Yours is better, Sergei says. Yours is so great. Yes, mine's, sup mine's, mine's, mine's superior. It's super great, the goldfish says, sounding impatient. I'm a magic fish. I'm fluent in everything. All the while... The puddle of blood from the earring kid's head is getting bigger and bigger, and Sergei is on his toes, up against the kitchen wall, desperate not to step in it, not to get blood on his feet. You do have one wish left, the fish reminds Sergei. He says it easy like that, as if Sergei doesn't know, as if either of them ever loses count. No, Sergei says. He's shaking his head from side to side. I can't. He says, I've been saving it, saving it for something. For what? The fish says. But Sergei won't answer. That first wish Sergei used up when they discovered a cancer in his sister. A lung cancer. The kind you don't get better from. The fish undid it in an instant. The words barely out of Sergei's mouth. The second wish Sergei used up five years ago on Sveta's boy. The kid was still small then, barely three, but the doctors already knew something in her son's head wasn't right. He was going to grow big, but not in the brain. Three was about as smart as he'd get. Sveta cried to Sergei in bed all night. Sergei walked home along the beach when the sun came up. And he called to the fish, asked the goldfish to fix it as soon as he'd crossed through the door. He never told Sveta. And a few months later, she left him for some cop, a Moroccan with a shiny Honda, and his heart. Sergei kept telling himself it wasn't for Sveta that he'd done it, that he'd wished his wish purely for the boy. In his mind, he was less sure, and all kinds of thoughts about other things he could have done with that wish continued to gnaw at him, half driving him mad. The third wish Sergei hadn't yet wished for. I can restore him, says the goldfish. I can bring him back to life. No one's asking, Sergei says. I can bring him back to the moments before, the goldfish says. Before he knocks on your door, I can put him back to right there. I can do it. All you need to do is ask. The wish my wish, Sergei says. My last. The fish swishes his tail back and forth in the water the way he does. Sergei knows when he's truly excited. The goldfish can already taste freedom. Sergei can see it on him. After the last wish, Sergei won't have a choice. He'll have to let the goldfish go. His magic goldfish. His friend. Fixable, Sergei says. I'll just mop up the blood. A little good sponge and it'll be like it never was. That tail just goes back and forth. The fish's head steady. Sergei takes a deep breath. He steps out into the middle of the kitchen, out into the puddle. When I'm fishing, while it's dark and the world is asleep, he says, half to himself and half to the fish. I'll tie that kid to a rock and dump him in the sea. Not a chance, not in a million years when anyone ever find him. You killed him, Sergei, the goldfish says. You murdered someone, but you're not a murderer. The goldfish stops swishing his tail. If on this, you won't waste a wish. Then tell me, Sergei, what's it good for? It was in Bethlehem, actually, that Jonathan found his Arab, a handsome man who used his first wish for peace. His name was Munir. He was fat with a big white mustache, super photogenic. It was moving the way he said it, perfect the way in which Munir wished his wish. Johnny knew even as he was filming that this guy would be his promo for sure. Either him or that Russian, the one that faded 
with the faded tattoos that Johnny had met in Jaffa. The one that looked straight into the camera and said, if he ever found a talking goldfish, he wouldn't ask of it a single thing. He'd just stick it on a shelf in a big glass jar and talk to him all day. It didn't matter about what. Maybe sports, maybe politics, whatever a goldfish was interested in chatting about. Anything, the Russian said, not to be alone. If you're following along, I choose to believe that's a happy ending. He used his last witch, which is he used his last wish to save the boy. And the Russian is now sad. He's alone. Goldfish is gone. All he wanted was a friend. Anyway, I like that story for whatever it's worth. I hope you did too. Have a good night and a better tomorrow.